development practices. And I wanted to take this chapter um, in part because I haven't done a chapter in a while, but also because this is a part of the package um, development process that I know nothing about. So I wanted to see if I could learn. Um, so we're zooming like back from the really um, specific aspects of developing a package and now talking about general software development practices that can make you more productive, raise the quality of work and promote um, reproducibility. And what this slide doesn't say, but also I think applies um, based on the book chapter is that if you're following these best practices, you're probably also gonna save yourself a lot of grief because um, you'll be able to catch errors earlier and um, make sure that when you're integrating new changes that it's not disrupting the um, ability of the package to, to perform and to do what it needs to do. Um, let me just hide my controls real quick. Over here, okay, there we go. Um, okay, so the first part of this chapter, um, I think most of us probably will find pretty intuitive, which was that they recommend using an IDE with support for our package development, usually our studio. I think that's what most of us have been using um, as we go along. I'd be curious to hear from if anybody has experience trying to develop our packages in a different IDE. I've never really used anything other than our studio, um, including for non-package development. Um, and then they also recommend using Git and GitHub. They mention that Bitbucket and GitLab are other options um, and SVN, um, sorry, I'm conflating these. They, they mentioned that SVN is an alternative to Git and they mentioned that GitLab and Bitbucket are alternatives to hosted version control of GitHub, but that the vast majority of people seem to use um, Git and GitHub as a comparison, as a, as a, a combination. And then they also talk about continuous integration, continuous deployment, which we're going to um, talk about in a moment. Um, the reasons to do this um, are a combination of because everyone does and you just should because it's standard practice. And then also um, concrete examples of like using version control makes your own life easier, prevents you from making bad mistakes that you can't undo and um, saves you saves you grief early uh, by letting you catch errors earlier. So yeah, Git and GitHub, um, they talk about how 94% of version control is Git. I don't know if that's, I don't know how up to date that is, but it was an interesting statistic to find. Um, they recommend Happy Git and GitHub for the, for the user, which is a book that I use all the time when I'm teaching Git um, and GitHub and those procedures are still, um, I still follow those and they make it pretty seamless. And I really like how they have in particular different workflows for like starting a project, whether you're starting with, um, the GitHub portion first or last, whether you're using an existing project versus a new project. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this book, but I would highly recommend it, um, especially to beginners. It's really useful. Um, and I also liked how this chapter touched on some of the non-version control benefits of using Git and GitHub. So issues in particular are really great. Um, many of you probably have used them before. When I first started using issues, it was in a job where I was working remotely and it was my first job um, where I was responsible for software in any capacity. It wasn't exactly a development job, but um, it really allowed me to communicate effectively with my bosses and keep track of uh, the different things I was supposed to tackle. And of course, users can open issues for your package, can open feature requests, bug reports, et cetera. But I also find that issues are just a really good way to manage my own work on a package and keep track of what I need to do and when and what my progress has been on each of those um, components. So big, big fan of the issue tracker. Um, they mentioned collaboration, um, using pull requests, using feature requests in the issues, um, basically a way to manage um, others contributing to your package in a non-chaotic way. And then um, they also point out how using uh, GitHub for version control is really advantageous because DevTools allows, DevTools and Pack allow for installation of the development version of the package really easily. Um, I'm not familiar with how easy it is to do that sort of thing through GitLab and Bitbucket. I'm sure there's also ways, but last time we talked about websites and we talked about how your development version might not always be the latest released version of your package, and it might be very important for people to be able to install whatever the most up-to-date version of the package is. So that's one advantage of GitHub as well. I didn't know um, SHA, uh, what that stood for, so Secure Hash Algorithms, and I did a little Googling, and it looks like that's the, um, the sort of identity of the version or the, the latest commit that you're on, and that's how Git keeps track of your 
um, your versioning of your repository. Um, and then, of course, as we saw in the last chapter, package down um, and uh, GitHub pages makes it really easy to have a website for your package. Again, not the only option, but a very good option and one that's really common and well integrated. So the CICD portion of this is the part that I was the least familiar with, so I found it really interesting to read this part of the chapter. So CICD stands for Continuous Integration, Continuous Deployment, and it just basically means that whenever a certain event happens, certain other events will immediately be triggered. Um, and the example that they give that I think is most relevant for our packages is to automate the R command check, um, which is that suite of checking functions that we can run manually in our studio, but we can also set up to run immediately when um, the package is pushed or when there's a new pull request. I went down a little rabbit hole at this point of trying to figure out why it's called a pull request instead of a push request. Um, and the reason is because the idea is you as the um, contributor are requesting that the package maintainer pull the changes that you have made, as opposed to thinking it from thinking of it from the contributor's point of view, requesting to push the changes that you have made. So it's a little bit backwards. I've always found that confusing. Um, Anyway, so they talk about how if you have a source package in GitHub, you could have um, multiple developers with push permissions to the main branch, or more commonly, you could just have one package maintainer with um, permission to push, and then any external contributors could push via um, a pull request, uh, which can then be, be integrated into the repository. And either way, you can have um, either of those two events trigger various GitHub actions um, to uh, do this continuous integration workflow. So then they talk about GitHub Actions and what those are. And of course, use this package is uh, coming to our rescue again, making it really easy to set up these GitHub Actions. Because as with so many other things, it seems like setting up GitHub Actions requires a whole bunch of finicky steps that you, of course, can do by hand, but you're going to forget something. Um, so this link has um, a workflow that already exists for these GitHub Actions that you can just borrow from. And they use some, they show some examples of use this commands, such as use this, use GitHub action check standard, which is um, setting up standard package checks for, um, for your R package on push or on pull request. This is an example of the output that you get when you use, use this, um, this, this command from use this. And it's showing you that basically it creates a um, hidden directory in your package folder called .github, which contains all the workflows um, in a subfolder. And those workflows are going to be YAML files. As we saw in the last chapter, YAML is used for many things. This is one of them. Um, and then it adds various things to the git ignore as well and makes sure that your Workflow YAML files are going to be in the right place in order to be run automatically so that you don't need to do a lot of tweaking. It also says that it adds a badge at the top of your readme. And there was a caveat in the book about how it only does this if your readme was also set up using use this or if you've gone through the steps to specifically indicate the place for the badge to go in your readme. So if you just made your own like text based readme or your own markdown file by yourself, it may not automatically do that. Um, I don't know, has anybody experimented with the conditions under which the badge gets um, gets added seamlessly versus has to be manually put on? I didn't have time to uh, check this. I have not. All it right. works when it works. <laughs> Great. Yeah. This is another thing where I feel like as a R newbie, I always wondered what those badges were and where they came from. So now I'm learning. Um, and yeah, uh, this, let's see, I guess I didn't update these slides fully. So it looks like they're just saying that use this has other, um, other uses as we saw. Um, and then here's another example of a GitHub action, which is to run basically, uh, a report of the test coverage when, um, when your package is pushed or updated, which is another pre-made action. Um, whoops, this didn't format correctly. Um, I just wanted to show a couple examples of GitHub Actions. So let me go. Can you all still see this window? 
Yeah, okay, cool. So the example they give in the book is that the R packages book has a GitHub action set up where every time an update is made to the book, it re-renders and republishes that book. So I actually just went to the R packages GitHub page and sure enough, we have this telltale.github folder that I never would have known what it was before. And now I know that it contains our workflows. Uh, we see we have a git ignore, which was presumably created by use this because this star.html um, line is what we saw use this was adding to the git ignore when we ran it. And if we go into the workflows, it looks like they only have the one YAML workflow in here called render. Um, and it actually says that it's down, it's derived from this examples directory that is linked earlier in the slides um, from this rlib slash actions um, listing of pre-made actions. So they've probably made some changes here. Um, and I was trying to sort of read through the YAML and, and as per usual with YAML, it's like somewhat readable, but then also has mysteries. Um, but it looks like this is scheduled to run every day at a certain time um, rather than um, every time the push happens, although I'm also a little confused because it says on push or on pull request. So maybe what this is saying is that it runs every day if these things aren't triggered. I wasn't entirely sure about that, but it looks like you can control how, um, how your workflows run. And then the other thing that um, I think is being um, shown here is it's they're using various locales and they're specifying particular operating systems here. And one thing that the book also highlighted was that the benefit of these GitHub actions over, say, clicking the build button in your R Studio window yourself is that um, automatically running the R command check. Um, as part of a GitHub action has the ability to test it on different operating systems sort of virtually, which is really beneficial because it, you might catch errors that you wouldn't otherwise catch on your own computer. So yeah, we can read more into this if we want to. Um, we can see that it's uh, uh, deployed. Just to interrupt for yeah. a second, the uh, the deployed or the whatever, the triggers mm -hmm. are um, and. So it ah, will okay. do it in those situations and on a schedule. So they're so they're running it every day, even if there haven't been any pushes. Yeah, and yeah. they do that um, probably to get an early alert if something breaks in a package that they reference. Uh -huh. So even if they haven't edited anything in a while, they want to update the book in case something weird happens. That makes sense, yeah. And I can't think of really any reason not to do that. I mean, it's not, it's just happening on the GitHub side, right? So is there any... Like, I think technically there are limits on yeah. how much you can run. So if you're running into that, you know, like, you know, don't run it every minute. Right. Okay. <laughs> you'll, you'll pretty definitely hit the limits if you do. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I have, uh, uh, I have some API things where we have things that run on a timer just to make sure that the API, like the ones that actually hit the API, so we can um, see if something broke in the right. you know the part that we can't control um that's cool yeah but yeah I, <laughs> I feel like they're with apis in particular there have been a couple of our packages that i've used in the past that are interfacing with certain apis and there have been at least two or three where i go on the issue tracker or whatever and somebody's like this doesn't work and the people respond it's like oh yeah they completely overhauled the api and now like half of our functions don't work and like sorry yeah yeah, it's always interesting with API packages. You have to be careful um, to see if they're staying up to date. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, whoops. So I guess this didn't get spaced correctly, but I will fix it after. This is a bunch of different links. Um, I thought that it was also interesting. Um, this um, Quarto Actions uh, repository was linked somewhere in the book or in blog post linked to from the book. So I was just clicking around. And um, these are particular GitHub actions that are useful for Quarto documents. So you've got a setup, you've got render and publish. And so that's if you're working on um, specifically Quarto docs, you could borrow some of the GitHub actions from here. I'm very grateful that these exist because as we saw last time, YAML can be tricky and I would be a little scared to try to write 
a GitHub action from the ground up, especially to do something that is a pretty standard thing to do. Um, however, you can do pretty much anything. Um, so there's, um, I guess this isn't a particularly good example. Um, there was a section in one of these actions, um, YAMLs that I saw that had basically what looked like a block of R code with just YAML variables inserted into it. It looks like you can pretty much just run arbitrary R code if you want to, um, depending on your needs. Um, while I was reading about this, I also discovered this appendix in the um, in the packages book, which is a list of all the checks that happen when you run the R command check. Uh, it has over 50 individual checks and you know you can reference them all here. So I thought that was interesting because I was trying to remind myself what even happens when you run that. And then, sorry, my Zoom window keeps really not cooperating. Please go over there, thank you. Um, and then, yes, and so if you did want to write your own GitHub action, this um, reference for YAML syntax and specifically for GitHub actions and like how to set up a YAML file to write your own GitHub action is here. So if you wanted to get brave or if you wanted to understand one of these existing actions in a more informed way, um, you could go to this page as well. Okay, um, there wasn't much else in this chapter. So um, does anybody wanna discuss any portions of it? That was the end of the slides. Um, I have yet to actually implement CICD for my package, but I think it would be a really good idea and it's something I'm gonna do next. I know of course, John has done this a lot. Um, I was just going to say it's one of those things kind of like uh, the discussion last week where if you're working with a public repository, at least it, they make it so easy. Mm -hmm. Just like, just do it. it. It makes your life easier, not harder. Um, but it was one of those that I put off for a long time. I'm like, Oh, it's, it's gotta be hard. Like it just mm -hmm. has to be. And no, well, it sounds <laughs> scary. It sounds like yeah. software. -y. It, it sounds, <laughs> yeah, there's all these like terms. And I mean, you know, you do end up putting in uh, different work to take advantage of all the CI CD because it sure. definitely strongly encourages you to get pretty good about testing and you know, all the other things we've talked about throughout the book. But I mean, that's good to do anyway. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, the website stuff, when I tried that, that just, I don't know, kind of cracked me up. It's like, oh, it just works. You oh, don't okay. have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Like use this just does it. So, and that's pretty true for the package stuff or for the test, you know, test stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't used the direct use this commands in a while because I got it working how I like it. And now I have my own function that calls various use this functions and stuff. So I can't remember what I do exactly, but um, okay. it's all use this under the hood seeing the chat now but yeah you we talked about the and yeah um i also feel like i only sometimes use use this and often just kind of go by what i know how to do um <laughs> but there are some days when it's like i should just throw myself in and use use this exclusively and maybe my life would be a lot easier in some some ways that i have not yet anticipated um who knows Targets is another one where I recently, um, you know, I had been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off because I thought it would be so complicated. And it took, I, I was set aside an entire day at one point. I was like, I'm going to learn targets today. And like an hour later, I was like, oh, I learned targets. <laughs> I didn't need the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can we, thank you for doing this presentation so much. Can we use some of the extra time to talk a little bit more about GitHub Actions since there are uh, sure. <clears throat> experts in the room? <laughs> yeah. um, so I've only barely played with it and not in the context of a package, just as a way to get our code to run um, on a server on a schedule. Um, so are there so John, you mentioned that it's like there's it's trivial to do on a public repository. Yes. I feel like there's something implied there that what is it like? <laughs> what, what's what is actually happening? And so like you're sending your code to a server. So what 
right, externally somehow. So if it's some sort of private thing, what sort of privacy concerns do you have? I guess if it's already on public it's, GitHub, private repo, there's the same level of security. Obviously, you have to pass keys in some ways. And then what about, do you know about how enterprise GitHub interacts with them? Or that depends on how your enterprise instance is set up? What it sort of environment how it's you have set up. And, and the main thing, it isn't like a privacy or security thing. It's that it's free for public repos and mm -hmm. not always okay. free for private repos. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't worked with any private repos in a bit, so I'm not sure. Like they, um, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, like Gmail or different things where it, they used to charge and they charge less and less for different pieces of GitHub because they don't need to wall these pieces off for enterprises to want to pay for GitHub. Like they want to make everything private. So, and you know, they want more control over what people can do and whatever. And so I think it has some amount of GitHub action runs available for private repos now, but I don't know. And then if it's enterprise, you have a larger limit than whatever the baseline is. Um, and okay, it's but the, but the CICD oh, would ahead. be operating in the enterprise situation and like what does the enterprise situation need to you know the examples of oh it's running on linux or windows or whatever like those various things is that part of an enterprise setup like how many different types of options you have for testing your code or yeah i don't know um i i mean i don't think it would be that there's a limit it would just be um, you might have your own runners set up that have like even more strict, um, not rules, but just specifications of these are the exact kinds of machines that we want to simulate. Um, and like I said, I think there might be limits on how many runs, uh, per month or whatever. And so that would be something to look into, but I don't know. I could be totally wrong. Maybe it's all free now. Um. I can't remember the last enterprise one I worked on. I, I know that I had GitHub Actions running and I don't think I was uh, getting yelled at. <laughs> like, I think it was all well within what they had paid for. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's fine. What about how do you decide, and maybe this is covered in like the RLib um, in wherever, yeah, Actions, but how do you decide how many types of environments and what is that yeah. actual word for environments that you care about testing in? Like for the book, presumably, I don't know. Presumably for some things you don't really care very much and others you care a lot. And do you know what yeah. that line is? Or? There's a, a command that I can't think of right now exactly, but it's like, um, you know, use tidyverse GitHub actions or something like that. And they test mm -hmm. on like everything um and i'm trying to see if i have an example handy generally i go through and comment out a bunch and then maybe if i'm going to release the cran i'll think about turning them all well usually what i do is i still run them all but i don't require them uh in my my branch protection rules because i want to know if you know two versions two two versions ago of R on Mac fails. Cool, you know, that'd be nice to know, uh, especially if it's gonna go to CRAN, but I usually don't, like I don't make that something that will stop me from merging something. It's like, oh, that'll be an issue that I need to fix before I go to CRAN if I decide to go to CRAN. Um, and I'm trying to get like a real package up in the C. And I don't know, it kind of depends, like the more the more widely used I want something to be, the more strict I am with myself about those tests. Um, the package, the family of packages that I'm working on, on a grant, I'm running the tech checks on pretty much everything um, and requir like requiring them to pass. Uh, but yeah, so strategy is what that's actually under. Um, actually, well, I think it can be other under other places, but in the um, setup that they use, you can set up a matrix of different 
like OS and R combinations and technically other things, you could set up all kinds of variables. Um, and it'll do different things. So <laughs> I don't have a strong answer there. It really, really, really depends on what you're doing. Um, ideal, you know, you want it to test on your main use case or use cases. So like if you have some people working on Windows, some people working on Mac, and then a server that is also running it, then yeah, you should check on Windows, Mac, and uh, Ubuntu or different Linux. Um, there are lots of runners available. I only use the baseline that they use, you know, that they like automatically set up. I know there was a thing, um, my old, one of my old jobs, we had kind of um, Amazon, at, it was hard to set up, <laughs> harder to set up, better, like more modern uh, Linux, like they, they were locked at a certain version. And so we would always run some of our test things at that version. And we got Torch to also include that in their test suite until it became too old and ridiculous because uh, it was old and stupid. <laughs> and finally, Amazon updated it. So, um, yeah. So, okay. How do branch protection rules fit into this? So, I am a big fan. Let me get one. Um, oops. Um, if you go to, uh, especially again on public repos or I think enterprise, you can set this up. You can go to branches and branch protection rules. And I always add one for main or whatever you call your main branch. Um, that <laughs> even on the ones that I'm just doing for myself, I require a pull request before merging, but I uncheck the require approvals because I'm not going to take the time. I, I used to always do this, but now I'm like, I don't need to approve uh, or override the setting to not require an approval on my own pull request. If no one's ever going to review it, I won't do that. And, but then I also have check there's require status checks to pass before merging. And once the actions have run once, you can set them as being required. It doesn't let you do that if they've never run because it doesn't know what, what the list is. But you can um, find, you know, like I require uh, Ubuntu latest uh, release usually. And then again, depending how strict I am, I'll uh, do more and more of those be required to run. Um, usually I also require a package down. And the nice thing about this is when I am working just with myself, I get to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm done. I do use this PR push and it creates the pull request. And then I just click auto merge. And if all my checks pass, it'll just merge it. But if my checks fail, it won't merge it. And so I can, you know, use that to find out whether I need to fix something or not. And assuming I've been checking everything on my own computer, all that's really telling me is, oh, on a different machine, it's going to fail. Or under this, you know, you were using something that you have locally, but you forgot to specify that this package is not required, different things like that. And so... Um, if you're working with anyone, I am a big fan of requiring an approval, even if it like just you and one other person going back and forth approving things because you will forget things. <laughs> and I almost like, you can't approve your own things on GitHub. And I wish they let you do that because I would, if they let me approve my own, I would still require approvals and just, you know, make me actually look at the code and say, yeah, okay, that's what I meant to do. Because without that, it I technically could check in something that I didn't mean to check in or different things like that. So um, anyway, yeah, I think that answered. <laughs> That's really helpful. Thanks, John. Because like, I, you know, I could present the chapter, but I don't have any of this. Expertise. <laughs> it's, it's really helpful. Did you, just, did you learn all of this by doing basically? It, yes. Yeah. Um, a lot of it. Well, by <laughs> I learned this by use the scene to a large degree of, oh, they have a command to do that. I should see what that's about. Um, and then looking at what they do on different repos and comparing it to some other open source projects. Cause you know, 
not everyone does it exactly like study verse um i'm pretty close at this point they they do so they have some commands and use this that set up a whole suite of things the way they like it um but some of those things just don't make sense for anyone who is not them like it literally tries to use a template from their like you know from their organization that won't work if you're not them and so i created my own version of that basically that goes through all the use this and almost exactly like um create tidy package or whatever it's called yeah create tidy package so i just looked at the code of that and made my own version of it that doesn't break um and uses all the same kind of you know kind of rules um, and actually more than what they do there, because I, I automatically set up all the GitHub actions. Um, and I set up some rules, like pre-commit hooks, so that if I edit the um, readme RMD and don't knit it, it won't let me check that in uh, because it makes you knit it before um, before that's ready, which happens by default if you use readme RMD, but the pre-commit hooks like overwrite one another. And so, if you just use the use this commands, you can only have one pre-commit hook, but I fixed that <laughs> so that I have, a, I don't remember. Uh, oh, it also like stops me from checking into the main branch because I want to always be using a pull request. So, um, which uh, I had it, I don't have it handy, but I'll, I'll share my um, create, package uh my version into the um the chat the slack yeah cool thanks i feel like an underrated skill that i'm picking up from reading this book um i don't know if anyone else can relate is like being able to look at a repository on github and understand what i'm looking <laughs> at or like understand <laughs> how to read it because it's really not intuitive. I mean, the first, I remember when I was very new to this and I would go to it, somebody would say, oh, it's on GitHub. And I'd <laughs> go to the GitHub repo and I'd be like, I am confronted with a bunch of folders and icons and files with bizarre names. And some of them have like underscores and some of them have dots and I have no idea what any of them are. And, you know, even like all these conventions that I think to some people read as just like obvious background noise, like using yeah. um, index.md for mm -hmm. your like homepage on a Quarto site or whatever. It's, like, <laughs> it's not obvious to me why index would be the <laughs> home. Like, why isn't it called home? You know, so like all these things. Is... And I think with uh, with an, with the R packages, um, being able to now look at a, um, a repository and be like, oh, that's a package because I recognize the structure. I know what man means and I know what R means. And now I, I have this additional, like I know what the dot, dot GitHub folder means. Um, it just, it helps, helps build fluency. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the index one just made me giggle because it's because some physicists at CERN decided that's what to do on the web and you know, when they in, in invented the internet or the web, whatever. So yeah, that is, it's totally um, confusing in a lot of ways. Uh, I still don't know why, you know, like why is the standard like underscore package down dot YML and underscore quarto dot YML. It makes them easy to find. So I guess probably that it puts all those setting Something files kind of at the top. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I adopted it for a thing I'm working on that there's underscore beekeeper dot YML in my stuff. So, um, but I don't a hundred percent know why. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely like reading other people's code is one of the most useful things you can do to learn. I, I have done lots of little pull requests on like tidyverse packages and stuff, mostly because I wanted to read the code to figure out how to do something. I'm like, oh, there's a typo in that document or um, the way they call this. I don't think it's quite what they meant to do. <laughs> you know, you can see where it could be cleaner or whatever. And so uh, I find that very, very useful for learning. I think my favorite example of like weird conventions is things like blog down or package down in order to understand why it's called something down 
you have to go back to mark down and then you have to go back to mark up and understand like it's a markup language and then somebody made a mark down like like there's so <laughs> yes. many iterations and the answer to each question is like because it was based on a thing before it yeah. and in, this, in my experience there's a lot of like unintentional gatekeeping that happens when um people act as if these terms are deeply meaningful when yeah. in fact they are very arbitrary in many cases and we, if we just acknowledged that, I think it would help confused people be less confused or at least feel less bad for being confused. There's the programming convention of you use foo and bar as your like random words. And I read somewhere about how like no one knows why, like people, people know why they started it, but new programmers are like, what the hell is foo and what is bar? And so it can cause confusion. And so I, try not to do that it's really hard that because that's what everyone does but i try to use variables that have meaning even in examples and stuff um because that's one of those that everyone's like oh no that's just what you do it's like yeah but why like it doesn't make any sense why would you do that well you know the story for that one right well not programming specific i oh, know the well, isn't it doesn't it come from fubar f-u-b-a-r I, yeah i assume so um yeah. but yeah and then, of course, uh, you know, there's the added piece that Baz is the one that comes after bar if you need a third oh, one. don't know about Why? that. Why? No idea. I, but yeah. I know that's what you do. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that's that chapter. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Chevin, Rebecca, did you, where are you coming in from? Like, had, had either of you used GitHub Actions before? Or is this going to be your first entree to it or, or what? I've um I've like dabbled with it, but just in like workshops where they like hold my hand and just go through the <laughs> like steps to do it. And it seemed it seemed pretty straightforward, at least in the examples that we went over. Um, so yeah, I think like John said earlier, it's probably just a matter of like getting my feet wet and actually doing it some more. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, I have close to no experience with it and I'm excited to hear it's not that bad because uh, yeah, I have some clunky things that I know could be improved by them <laughs> for sure yeah I, I had a else. whole bunch of stuff where I I didn't use use this for a lot of the I don't know standard package things and for creating pull requests and all that and then finally took you know just was just decided to switch over and it was another one of those of oh I, it was so hard so much harder to not switch over than it was to switch over so <laughs> <laughs> um John do you know if there's any um if like there's any plans to to try to get like Jenny on for like questions uh, or... I had that thought and then forgot about it um I will try I'll I'll ping her and see um we're coming up against posit count in the timing yeah. of when we're going to finish. And I don't know how busy she is with that. I know uh, to like, I know she handed off the things they forgot to teach you about our workshop mm -hmm. hasn't done it in a while on purpose so that she can have a little bit more freedom, but actually she's teaching a different uh, the, yeah. Like basically she's teaching a version of the one that she and Hadley taught last year, I think. So um yeah so i don't know i'll see um i'll try to get her in one way or another if it's got to be at, you know after posit comp after we've been done for a bit or if she has to come before the last week or whatever so i'll see i'll do that right now <laughs> um yeah one one question i was thinking of that would be like good for the author and maybe maybe you have some thoughts on this too but um 
like I felt like uh, there is definitely some choices with like narrowing down software development practices, like in general, just to like the topics that they went over. So like, just curious, like what she might have wanted to include, but didn't, and maybe like, maybe you have some thoughts on other like software development practices that weren't included as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't, um, I mean, to a degree there's, there's like the other level of software design practices, which is the new book that Headley is sporadically working on the, um, design.tidyverse.org that is more like how to write code or how, like design principles for code. Um, it's not just, it's not quite the same thing, but it's more like kind of philosophy of how to write functions and, and how to, how to organize arguments and different things like that. Um, so there's that. They didn't go into, so at the um, open source uh, manager workshop last summer that uh, Tracy Teal ran, she went over a lot on like code of conduct and contribute contribution guide and all that stuff that they, I think, I don't remember if in, within the chapter, no, I can't remember if they touched that or not, but within the, um, you know, use this has commands around it, but they don't uh, really talk about why to do different things. And so that's something that's not here. Um, that is, that was really useful actually to really dig in and think about how to reply to issues and um, how to use issue templates and how to um, set expectations uh, with contribution guides and things like that. Mm. Um, so there's all that. And yeah, it, it, it probably is <laughs> multiple books. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like, I don't even think she talk, talks about it in happy get with R. Um, because that's still just kind of mechanically how to use Git, not why. Um, yeah, so she mentions to go read other people's uh, contributing.md in there, but doesn't talk about writing your own. Um, and so that's something, uh, you know, something that's not covered in a lot of places. And that's actually, it's, it's another one of those on the secret conventions that there are certain file names that you can put in certain places and it changes the way that GitHub works. So if you have contributing.md, when you create an issue or pull request, GitHub tells you to read it. If it doesn't exist, they don't do anything about it and they don't tell you that you should make it. They just use it if you do. Um, and code of conduct is the same. Uh, the issue templates that you can, like you can make a form for issues through GitHub's interface entirely, not like you don't have to uh, set up a separate web page or anything like that. Like if you do certain things, it'll do that, which I need to get around to doing one of these days for Teddy Tuesday data sets. Um, but all those kinds of things are are like definitely the hidden pieces of software dev and that's just github you know let alone how to decide on an ide um i would like to see i do feel like a lot of it is uh do you work with other people who use a different one then probably use that one uh if otherwise use our studio um or if you're a nerd and want to configure something else just to have done it i think that's the other reason that people use vs code so Anyway, um, just kind of wondering <laughs> on that. Yeah, I feel she like does. that. Oh, go ahead. 
<clears throat> oh, sorry. I, I feel like that topic can be like, you can go into like many rabbit holes. Yeah, like just that section at the very end, other uses for GitHub Actions. And she says, you know, well, you can do it to use it to use anything or to do anything, basically. And has a couple examples, but I, every once in a while I'll, I'll hit another one. Like having a test suite, you know, a specific test suite that only runs monthly or weekly or something rather than your normal suite of tests. If it's something that's, you know, if you're trying to check on people outside of you, did someone else break my package? Um, that's something they don't really talk about. In here, I think, I think they might have. Um, like I, I think there might be a mention of it um, in the test chapters that, you know, this is, we're showing you how to do unit tests and there are technically other types of tests that maybe you would want to do, but they don't ever really go into that kind of thing. Um, and so that'd be another piece that I would put kind of, it's mostly in the software development best practices kind of idea because it's uh you know you can't include it in the book because they don't know what weird issues you have, but telling you how to figure that out, I guess, is what is a little bit missing. So all right. Um Okay, I was thinking life cycle was super short, but it's not. So uh, we only have the, the two chapters. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> did you want to um, do the last chapter? Uh, were you, were you, so uh... two weeks is 20th. Uh, I think I will have something to try to push to Cran. Um, okay. And I think that makes it fun. But if anyone else has something, I mean, we could maybe push multiple things to Cran on, in that last session. Um, there is also actual content to go over, I guess. So I don't know how that will work. If maybe we want to do an extra week of actually doing it. But uh, the actual push to Cran doesn't take that long. It's the... Um, all the nerve wracking stuff leading up to it. Um, I will say my preview on Cran stuff is people make a big deal about how mean and hard and whatever it is. And just like, I don't know, they might say something mean, but don't, it's just one ornery person's opinion. Don't, don't let it get you down. Because, <laughs> yeah. and for the most part, like things that have been pointed out to me on Cran submissions have always been right <laughs> like oh yeah that that would make this better i should do that so um yeah but i think we have some talk about like why and all that and i think someone just pulled in so uh for me this is <laughs> gonna be a good timing on wrapping up but yeah i will try to contact uh jenny and see um it might be early in this that she won't be too too totally booked up Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, Rebecca or Kaya, are you currently working on any packages? Um, I have one, but it isn't ready to push. And honestly, I'm not even sure if putting it on CRAN even makes sense because it's an internal thing for my team that's not really going to have any broader applications. So I don't think I can have that ready on that on um, a timeline to to do it. Um, yeah, working on, but definitely not Cran. Okay. <laughs> I had a package idea, um, and then we went over the licensing chapter, and so I checked out the data license agreement for the data I was going to use, and figured out that um, in the license it doesn't allow like web scraping of the data. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, well, I don't think my package will work now. <laughs> <laughs> Dope. That's funny. Uh, it, there's a piece on that in 
can't remember if it's in R4DS or the um, RVEST documentation. I think it is R4DS basically talking about like, yeah, but is it really bad? <laughs> so <laughs> it depends on the situation. Like, if it's just, you know, it's hard to copyright facts. Um, you can copyright the format of facts, but it's hard. you can't copyright just information. So hmm. I am not encouraging you to scrape data that you're not allowed to scrape. I'm just saying, make sure you read things carefully because yeah. people like to claim uh, ownership of things they don't necessarily have ownership of. <laughs> I, I, it's funny because I did it previously um, for uh, bike share data and it wasn't in a package um but then i like presented on it and like people from the company like checked it out mm. <laughs> and then i found then i actually found the data agreement and was like oh oops <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you know you can you can certainly get your account suspended by doing that oh, yeah that much they can certainly control so um all right, but yeah, I, I again, I am not recommending that anyone break any uh, agreements on scraping and whatnot. <laughs> it's very, it's very fair. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, good discussion today. Um, I will see, hopefully, see everyone next week, um, and then we're getting wrapped up. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Bye, everyone.